Well, everybody, good evening. This is Brother Charles, live from studio uh, pastor's office and study here at Macedonia Baptist Church. It is good to, to be with you all tonight. We'll have a few, I think, join in just a minute. Uh, but just in case for those who will be listening to this later, uh, we will be coming out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tonight, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, as we continue our study there. Uh, looks like we've got a few um, joining with us right now. I don't know how to, to tell who it is and who isn't here. It looks like uh, Miss Judy Dunaway is with us, so good evening to you, Miss Judy. It's uh, such a blessing to, to see you on here tonight. We'll see who else is going to join on with us here in a few minutes. It looks like Marvin and Millie are here, so it's good to see them um, tonight. If um, Miss Judy or Brother Marvin and Miss Millie, if y'all have any prayer requests, if you want to put them in the comment section, I'll be sure to, to mention them. And that's for any of us um, tonight. If you have any um, prayer requests, if you'll put that in the comment section, I'll make sure um, that, I, um, that I will uh, mention those. Looks like Brother, Ken, uh, Brother Danny and Miss Karen are with us, and so we're thankful for them joining us tonight. Um, Let's continue to pray for Miss Almeida. Uh, Miss Almeida is at home. Um, I talked to her last night for a few minutes, and um, she said that her kidneys, I mean, not her kidneys, but her gallbladder is not hurting anymore. They did not go in and do the scope, um, but that stopped hurting while she was at the hospital, and so they let her go home. And so we're going to praise God for that and, and hope that Miss Almeida. Uh, will be home. Will be able to stay at home and won't have any more problems uh, with her um, gallbladder. I need to continue to pray for Miss Karen and um, Adams and her blood pressure. Though we need to continue to pray for her in that way. Um, also, my mother-in-law, um, Pauline Walker, she's been having some difficulty uh, with her blood pressure while I was down there for just a few minutes um, on Monday. I drove in and did some work for her and came back. Uh, Monday night, but she is um, she's having some trouble with her blood pressure and with her heart racing a little bit. So y'all be praying for her. She's really concerned about possibly going back into AFib and uh, or having to have ablation again. So we're going to pray that doesn't happen, and we'll pray that she um, gets better. Uh, it's good to have uh, Miss Beverly and, and Brother Roger on here with us and. Um, if you have any prayer requests, like I said, put it there in the comment section, and I'll try to make sure that I can announce that and, and let others know um, as well. I um, ask y'all to be praying for the, the family. We're going through some things right now, and so ask y'all to be praying for uh, my family and uh, my oldest and um, some decisions she's making. That's about as far as I'm going to get into that, uh, but y'all be praying for Amber. She she needs our prayer right now. Any other prayer requests? Any other prayer requests? I'm, I'm waiting to see if anybody puts that in there, and if they do, I'll be be sure to to try to mention them, to, to, to lift them up to the Lord. Um, looks like we've got about seven that are showing live. I'm going to wait just another minute or two um, before we before we go any further, uh, for those that are already on here with us, if you wouldn't mind, hit the like button, hit the like button, and also the share button. Um, and that way people can be hearing the word of God. And also, if you have your Bible with you tonight, um, go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, Looks like Miss Millie asked us to be praying for the family of um, Louise Wiseman. Um, so let's be praying for the Louise Wiseman family and uh, be, be lifting them up. Be lifting them up. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to being able to come back together on Wednesday night as a body in Christ, um, physically, not just virtually. I look forward to that day. Um, and so we'll be praying about that. We'll be meeting with the, um, the deacons Tuesday night. Um, and so uh, it's coming Tuesday night and trying to figure out what we're going to be doing in July. And so uh, be praying about that and be bathing that in prayer and what, how should we should move as a church um, from this point on. 
I know a lot of churches are uh, moving back into their their family or their their sanctuaries and stuff and so but I also know the numbers continue to increase so we're going to see where God leads us in that way um, we've got a few more it's a few minutes after seven now I believe and so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started in prayer once again continue to be praying for Miss Almeida she is at home seems to be doing better but continue to pray for her uh, continue to be praying for the Louise Wiseman family uh, Miss Judy said that we need to be praying for uh, Shirley Williams, um, her aunt who is in the nursing home, so let's be praying for her. Uh, continue to pray and lift up Miss Charlotte um, Hilliard um, as she battles cancer. Um, continue to pray for my family and uh, especially Amber and some decisions she's making. We need to lift her up, pray for her. Uh, and then, um, and so let's go ahead and also, one other prayer request uh, before I before I lose track and, and get all focus here. Be praying for the Willie Howerton family. Um, he was a, a church member of mine when I pastored Friendship and uh, there in, in Mariana, Arkansas. He passed away and Monday. Um, I went and um, drove out Monday morning and um, was able to officiate his service. And so, be praying for the Willie Howerton family as well. And then also my mother-in-law, Pauline Walker. So let's go to the Lord. Father God, we come before you. And God, we, we seek you tonight. and We seek your truth, Father God. We ask, Lord, that your hand be upon us. We ask, Father, for the prayer request that were mentioned, Lord. Uh, the um, Charlotte Hillard family, Lord. Miss Williams family. And uh, the others, Father God, that were on here on this list. Uh, uh, the Wiseman family, Father God. Uh, Miss Almeida, uh, my mother-in-law, Pauline, uh, we just lift them to you. Each one of those families, each one of those individuals have needs, Father God, and you know what they are. And so we seek your wisdom and uh, we seek your divine appointment for each one of these, uh, these prayer requests and uh, your divine will for each one of these prayer requests and each one of these families and these individuals and just ask that uh, your will would uh, remain supreme, Father God and that you would answer them according to your will, for we know it's good and perfect. And we pray for our nation, Father, as we see unrest, civil unrest, and we see um, just sin in action, Father God. That's all it is, is a lost world acting lost. And so we pray that, um, Father, you would bring conviction upon this land, you'd bring conviction upon your church, and may your church repent, and may your church begin to seek you in ways that it hasn't seeked you in many, many years. And may we see revival, Father God. May we see revival. And uh, we pray for our service tonight, that you'd be honored for the reading and teaching of your word. Uh, we pray, Father, that it wouldn't be I that speak tonight, but you that speak through me. It'd be your truth that people hear. And it'd be your truth and you that is honored tonight. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. If you would, take your Bible, if you have it tonight, over in your house, and uh, whether you're on your phone or your iPads or your computers or even on your TVs, if you have a smart TV, if you would, uh, take your Bible and open up the First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 5 tonight, First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to be going through verses 12 through 22. Uh, Paul is coming really to this doxology of his first letter to the church at Thessalonica. He's coming to the close of this letter, and he begins to list out a plethora of and final instructions to those at Thessalonica. And we need to understand something as a church, that the Word of God is just as viable and just as relevant today as it was when it was originally wrote some eons ago. Um, and the New Testament is roughly 2,000 years old, or we're getting pretty close to 2,000 years old. And the Old Testament even older than that, but the same truth that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica uh, and that's, is, is so relevant today, just like it was then. It's truths that we need to apply to our heart. 
And so as he begins to deal with relations and attitudes towards uh, the leadership of the church, toward other members in the church, he begins to deal with an inward attitude and also our spiritual integrity as we as individuals must have that. And so we're going to see how these truths apply to us today and how we can take them and apply them to our life. And may we feel challenged and may we be challenged and may we accept the challenge and, and press forward tonight as we begin our study in 1 Thessalonians. As, as, as we get there, once again, I'm just going to encourage you to hit like and share uh, on this message and, and maybe do a watch party just to get some people to hear the Word of God, not see my face. Uh, look, I scare people with this face, but uh, what I want them to know is the love of God and, and how we as Christians are to respond and love one another within the church and within it, and without the church. And so that's what we're going to be tonight. And so we begin in verses 12 and 13. And like I said, we'll go through verse 22. But we're going to begin with verses 12 and 13 and dealing with instructions in life. And specifically for these two verses, instructions towards leadership within the church. And so if you would, if you have your Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 12 and 13, it says... And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves, and be at peace among yourselves. And so we find these instructions towards leaders. Paul be, begins his doxology in relation to our leadership of leaders within the church. And both in both those leaders who serve among the people and those who are called to be overseers of the church. Now we have to understand this: the church body has absolute authority; it really does. Uh, but God calls overseers; He calls pastors and elders to 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 guide the body, to guide the church, and to lead the church as under shepherds. Jesus Christ being the ultimate under shepherd, but then the pastor as as an under shepherd to the church, and He reveals how important these relationships are. He reveals how important these uh, relationships are, but especially as he begins to the relationship, as he states, and we beseech you, brethren. He said, we're imploring you when we talk about these things. So what are his instructions? What does Paul say about our relationship with leaders in the church? Paul begins by stating this. He, he says, we're to have a relationship with our leaders. So we're having a, an actual relationship with them to know them. Uh, one of the things that I had as a problem with is growing up is I was always intimidated uh, by the pastor. All I saw was this man up there on the on the podium and everybody looked at him and everybody watched him and, and everybody listened to him and it just intimidated the living fire out of me. And then I became a pastor. And I realized as I become a pastor that uh, they're no different than I am. That they just like me are flawed. They just like me have hard times and they have good days and they have bad days and they, they struggle with different things and they just like they just like me. But I didn't know that until I really got to become a pastor, but but even more so until I had a relationship with my pastor. I had a relationship with my youth pastor, still have a relationship with my youth pastor. Talked to my youth pastor this afternoon and thanked him for not giving up on me when I was in school because I would have gave up on me, but he didn't. He, he, he loved me and he, he still took care of me, and so I thank him for that. But it wasn't until I had a relationship with these people that I realized just who they were. Um, some people guard themselves. They say, well, I'm not going to have a relationship with with another pastor maybe a pastor in the past has hurt you maybe somebody else has hurt you uh, and, and so we say well i'm, I'm going to keep my distance i'm going to keep everybody at arm's distance uh, you can't minister to each other not knowing one another how just as i as your pastor want to know you and i want to know what what causes you to tick what causes you to to, to move. I, I want to know what drives you. I want to know how you're hurting and how I can pray for you. Because in that process, I know how to minister to you. I know how to, to serve you better. Well, in the same way, if you really have no relationship with your pastor, have a relationship with your deacons or other Sunday school teachers or whatever it may be, you don't know how to pray for them. 
Uh, you don't know how to encourage them. You don't know how to lift them up. You think you do. Uh, but until you get to know them, uh, to actually truly know them, not just have general points of reference, but truly know them, you don't know how to pray for them. You don't know how to encourage them. Uh, we're to have respect for our leadership and know them well enough to understand them. Uh, we, 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 we need to learn e each other. Um, I, I was... Um, I, I, Mariana, Miss Judy, uh, Wilf, Judy, I call, we had another lady in the church called Judy Judy, uh, but Judy Wilf would always say, I'm not studying you, preacher. I'm not studying you. Um, I'll never forget how humbling it was the day she came up to me and told me, she said, uh, she said, Brother Charles, she said, I, I like you. I'm close to you. That was humbling to know that, uh, that she, she, she has a relationship with my wife and I that we love one another, we pray for one another. We need that in the church. We need to know each other's personality, our mindsets, our thought patterns, our triggers, those things that cause us to, 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 to maybe come uneasy, etc. This knowing of our leaders is for those who are among the body. It talks about Sunday school teachers, deacons, pastors. It says, them which labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. Even, even when the man, even when the pastor or somebody is, is admonishing you, i.e. correcting you or, or reproving you. I have come to a conclusion when I was a kid long ago, I had no problem with my mother or my father disciplining me. I had no problem with, with even a friend's parent disciplining me because they knew me. But if some stranger came up and tried to discipline me or, or tried to correct me or whatever it was, I would look I would look at that person like you have lost your ever loving mind. You don't even know me. So why are you trying to correct me? Brothers and sisters, it's hard to accept something from somebody you don't even know. It's hard to accept the truth from somebody that you don't know. And so Paul says, have a relationship with these people that labor among you, that are caring for you that are telling you the truth, that are, that, are, that are even at some points correcting you. Because it's a lot easier to have that relationship. It's a lot easier to have ministry among those you know. And so, so know your pastor, know your leaders. And then he says we're to have respect for our leadership. We're not only to have a relationship with our leadership, but we are to respect our leadership. He says, to esteem them very highly, to esteem them very highly, we're to, this respect should be out of love. He says, to esteem them very highly in love, not just knowledge-wise, not just head-wise, but that we are to truly acknowledge them and have respect for them and the love of God, knowing what they do, knowing what they sacrifice, knowing their heart. You, you can't love somebody and you can't have respect for somebody without first knowing them. And then he goes on and he says this, res this respect should be for the office they hold, not merely for the individual holding that office. He says for their work's sake. In other words, the office they hold. He should show respect for them and love them. You know, it, it is so hard to lead when people don't love you. It is so hard. To, 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 to give instruction when people don't care. Now, I have felt love here at Macedonia, and I praise God for that. I have felt respect from many here in Macedonia, and, and, I, and I love that, and I, and I honor that, and I don't take that lightly. But I know of pastors who have not had that same love, who have not had that same respect from the congregation, and it was the hardest thing for them to minister to those people. And those people refre refusing to have a relationship with that pastor, whether it was because of that pastor or because of another pastor who came in and hurt them. And so they were so afraid to have a relationship with another pastor, with another pastor or another deacon or whatever it is, because they'd been hurt so in the past. But the Bible says to forgive. We need to realize that not every leader, not every pastor, not every deacon, not every Sunday school teacher, not all those people are the same. And so you got to give everybody a chance and you got to love on them and you got to encourage them. And you have to realize for their work's sake, it is so much easier to minister and love on people when they love you. It don't mean you have, it doesn't mean that that pastor, even when the, when the church doesn't love them, that he stops. 
He still got to love them, but it makes it a whole lot easier. And so we are to have a relationship with our leadership. We are to respect our leadership. And we are to have a resolve for peace among the body. And you say, what does that have to do with leadership? What does that have to do with our leaders it, to have peace among the body? It says, be at peace among yourselves. One of the hardest and most stressful pastors is attempting to pastor a church or lead a church of a troubled and divisive church. It is hard to pastor people that are grumbling among themselves. It is hard to lead a flock when all they want to do is backbite and, and beat each other up. And so Paul's telling them at Thessalonica, have peace among yourself because it is hard to minister to you otherwise. Because if we're all bickering and fighting with one another, how can we even listen to the leadership? And then we start believing, well, leadership's taking sides because they don't agree with me on this one, but, but he may not agree with you on that. They may not agree with you, but then they may not agree on this other side the next time. And, and so it's just back and forth and it's divisive and nobody knows anybody. And it just causes division among the church. And so he tells them, respect your leadership and resolve to have peace among yourself so that we can love one another and so that we can minister together. And we're to do our best to strive for peace as much as dependent among us. Paul writes to the church at Rome, and if it, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. We're to do our best to, to have peace with one another. We're to have this unique relationship with our pastor, but uh, we should also have a strong relationship with our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So he not only has instructions towards our leadership, uh, but he also has instructions for the church. And he has instructions for us, you and I, as bodies, of, as members of the body of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and 15, it says, Now we exhort you, brethren, Warn them are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And so he gives the instructions of how we're to have, have relationship with our leaders, how we're to respect them, how we're to have relationships, how we're to respect them, how we're to resolve to have peace among them. And now he says, now let's look at the body. Let's look at the body for a minute and see how we're to have this relationship with them. Because he calls attention to our relationship with fellow believers in Christ and begins by stating he has a calling or encouragement for them. He says, now we exhort you, brethren. Paul had specific callings or instructions for the body of Christ as well. The first thing he says is warn those that are idle. Notice these instructions are to the brethren. They're to the body. They're not just to the pastor. They're not just to the leadership. They are to the body of Christ. It says warn those that are idle. That word is talking about being unruly in worship and doctrine. Those that are not paying attention or heeding the word of God. Those that are living a life contrary to scripture. He says warn them. Let them know what they're doing is wrong. Many times we say, well, the preacher needs to do that. No, it's not just the preacher's responsibility. The preacher's responsibility is to train, equip, and disciple believers in Christ to go out and serve Christ. We're to make disciples for Christ, and we're to train and equip. We, we do, we admonish. We, we do admonish. But brothers and sisters, it takes more than just the pastor standing behind a pulpit and saying, thus saith the Lord. It also takes that fellow brother or sister correcting each other, correcting each other in love, holding each other up. As Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia, bearing one another's burdens up. So we have to do that. We have to admonish one another. We have to warn those that are idle. But what about those in the church that are discouraged? Those in the church that are just broken down and broken hearted. Maybe it's because of the body. Of the, maybe it's because of the church they're in and what they see in the body. Maybe it's just through life's experience. Maybe it's they're just tired. You know what he says for them? He says, comfort the discouraged. Comfort the feeble-minded. He's talking about those that are discouraged, that are tired. Uh, brothers and sisters, we need encouragement right now. If I was to be honest with you right now, I need some comfort and encouragement. Um, Mary and I are going through some hard times right now. The family is too, and 
and and you know Amber is. We we need comfort. We need prayers of comfort. We need words of encouragement. That's that's what we're here for. I I, I normally don't mention a whole lot of it behind the pulpit because I'm the pastor. But brothers and sisters, we're to comfort one another. If you need encouragement, you need to let people know, I need to be encouraged. If you see somebody that needs encouragement within the body of Christ, encourage them. Uplift them. Reach out and say, hey, I'm praying for you. I love you. Anything I can do for you. And then we also need to help the weak. And that weak there, he's talking about those who are spiritually weak. We can't lose our patience on those that are spiritually weak. We have to help them. We have to support them. And that's what the Bible says to do, support them, to lift them up, to encourage them. And then, oh, the one that we probably have some of the hardest times with, practice patience with all. Brothers and sisters, I've said this so many times, patience is a virtue in which I don't have. Um, It's a fruit of the Spirit. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's part of growing in the Lord. Um, It's one that I probably have better than I know, Um, but it's one that we all have to exercise routinely is our patience with one another, our patience with brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. You know, I always expect the world to act lost. I expect lost people to act lost. That's what they are. They're lost. I find it hard at times to see Christians acting lost, though, and trying to find a way to 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 look at them and, and, and be patient with that. But that's what the Bible says to be, is to be patient with one another, to be patient in all that we deal with. And being patient doesn't mean getting payback. It's to see that none render evil for evil unto any man. It is natural. When somebody hurts us, we want to hurt them back. When somebody claws at us, we want to claw them back. But the Bible says not to do that. We're not to have an eye for an eye or a tooth for tooth. We're not to render evil for evil. But what we are to do is to speak the path of God above all. Seek a path of loving kindness. Seek a path of forgiveness. Seek a path of patience. Seek that which honors God, it says, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. We are to seek the best and the good, not only for those in the body of Christ, but those outside the body of Christ. We are to have this ever-evolving relationship that shows patience and shows kindness and shows love, shows admonition. We are to warn those who are idle. We are to comfort those who are, that, are feet, that are discouraged. We are to help the weak, and we are to be patient with one another. But it doesn't stop there. Because we also have to have a better attitude than we've had many times through the years. Because in verses 16 through 18, Paul begins to deal with the inner attitude of us, our attitude, our how we react in situations, how we just live normally. It says, Rejoice, it says, Rejoice evermore in verse 16. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 18. So we're to have a cheerful spirit despite our despite. Our situation, it says rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. It talks about having a cheerful spirit despite what's going on around us, despite what situation we're in. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He writes, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Oh, I can be sorrowful, but I can also rejoice. As poor yet making many rich. Just making the best out of it, baby. That I can be poor and yet I can still make you spiritually rich. By trusting in the Lord is having nothing and yet possessing all things. He says to rejoice always. To not allow our situation to dampen our spirits in the Lord. And to have a prayerful spirit. To have a prayerful spirit. To pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean we walk around all the time with our eyes closed and our hands up in the air praying. No, that's not what it's talking about. It means that we have a prayerful spirit, that we're always having this connection with God, that no matter our situation, no matter our circumstances, no matter what we're driving down the car, or we're cooking in the kitchen, or we're at work, or we're in a deacon's meeting, or preaching even behind the pulpit, or we're in Sunday school class, or we're with our kids at the lake, or at a swimming pool, or we're at the ball field, Wherever it may be, we're in a prayerful spirit, so we're in connection with God, 
and we can just stop and just pray that God lays on our heart. Pray for it. Pray that we're praying inside in a prayerful spirit and mindset at all times with God, trying to be open in communication with God. Are we doing that? And then we're to have a thankful spirit despite our situation, knowing that whatever happens, it's God's will for our life. It says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, wherever you're at, whatever situation you're in, whatever you're going through, thank God for it. And that's hard. Because some situations are hard. And you don't want to thank God during that time. In fact, the worst thing, the first thing you want to do is say, woe is me. But God says to be thankful despite our situations, knowing it's his perfect will, knowing he's in control. So let us do that. Let us know that wherever we're at, whatever we're going through, we can thank God and he's going to get us through it. And at the end of his plethora of instructions, he deals with our inner man or the integrity of our spirit. He says in verses 19 through 22, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. He says, let us not extinguish the spirit of God through our attitudes and actions. He says, quench not the spirit. Our attitude can quench the spirit of God. That word quench literally means to squash out, to to put out the fire of God in our lives. Our attitude towards others, our attitude towards one another, our, our attitude toward the Word of God, our attitude toward leadership, our attitude toward the church can quench the Spirit of God in our lives. He says, so don't quench the Spirit. Don't extinguish the Spirit of God in your life. Let us not ignore the Word of God. Let us not ignore the word of God. It says, despise not prophesying. At this time, it, it was literally people in the church projecting the truth of the word of God and talking about the word of God and, and telling what's going to happen according to the word of God. And so, you know, for some of us, we believe that all prophecy has ceased, that when the New Testament was completed, it was done. I believe that we have both a, 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 a complete word of God and, and yet an incomplete word of God. I, I believe that we that we have all that we need to know about God in the future, and that's what I say it's complete. But then I also acknowledge the fact that we don't know it all. And so, therefore, our revelation of God is incomplete. But with that said, even within that complete and incomplete revelation of God that we hold within the word of God, we, we're, we're not to ignore what God's word says. We're to hold on to this word and read it and study it and apply it to our lives. We're not to be merely hearers of the word, but doers of the word, because to not be doers of the word, we, we are literally, um, we are literally uh, messing ourselves up. We're, we're deceiving ourselves, as the book of James says. And then we got to learn to test all. Paul, when he says to prove all things, it literally means to test, to make sure it's accurate, to make sure it's right. And he includes himself in this in his own teachings. He, he's including the teachers there, the doctrine that there, the spirits, the attitudes, etc. He's saying it all, prove it all, test it all. Whether it was guest speakers, whether it was the whether it was him, whether it was the leadership of the church to test it. Brothers and sisters, we can't test anything without first knowing the word of God. We, we are to prove things. We are to make sure that what is taught is accurate and true. And then he says, let us grip onto the pure doctrine of Christ. Hold fast that which is good. To grip on to that which is good, what God has taught us and what is right and wrong. And then he says, let us abandon all shape of evil from our lives. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Many times in the church, we, this is where we compromise. We compromise in our music. We compromise in what we watch on TV. We compromise in what we allow ourselves to be part of. We compromise in what we allow ourselves to do. And we, we say, well, you know, we say this or we say that. He says to abstain from very, the very appearance of evil. And we say, well, I'm not doing it, but, but you were right there with them. So you're guilty of doing it. 
He says to abstain from this, to reject this, to abandon this. And so let us look at our lives and see what's in our lives that we need to get rid of, that we need to change. Because we're to be stepping stones, not stumbling blocks for the church of God. And so I close with this. Many times we do not take into consideration our attitude and reaction and response to our relationship with church leadership, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and even those without the body of Christ and how it affects the Spirit of God in His movement in our lives. We don't think of the cracks within our spiritual integrity that hurt not only us, uh, but the church too. And so may we learn to understand one another. May we learn to get to know one another. May we learn to know our leadership and have respect for them. May we learn to love one another with the love of Christ within the body of Christ. May we learn to mold our attitude to the attitude of Christ, and may we for certain learn to protect our spiritual integrity. For without integrity, we have no viable testimony. And all these other instructions will go empty without us first being where we need to be spiritually. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And God, I lift those that are hearing this message now, those that are watching this message, those that will watch it later. I pray, Father God, that you would absolutely touch our hearts. The God, you would convict us of sin in our life. Convict us where we haven't abstained from the very appearance of evil, convicting us where we haven't treated our leadership with respect, where we haven't got to know our, our leadership, where we've just ignored them, Lord. Forgive us where we've ignored your word and quenched your spirit because of the mouth and attitude and anger and words. God, we don't want to be a church or a people that quenches your spirit. We want to be one that puts gasoline on your spirit and allows there to be an explosion of your spirit. And so, God, be with us tonight and be with us as we, we finish up this Bible study in just a second. and Be with us as we turn off our iPads and our phones and our computers and um, we go back into our, our normal life. That, that God, we would, we would take this word and apply it to our heart. That we would be no longer just merely hearers of the word, but doers of the word, Father God. May we see life through your spiritual lenses, God. May we, may we strive to be your people. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I thank you for, for joining us tonight. I pray that you'll um, pray about, ponder if you live in the Ripley area, to come to one of our two services that we have live here at uh, Macedonia Baptist Church Sunday morning, both at 9 and 11. 9 o'clock is still for our seniors and those most vulnerable for the COVID, and then 11 o'clock service, we're still having live services there in the Family Life Center at 11 o'clock, and so I want to invite you to come be part of that. That's for everybody, and then um, we'll continue to have virtual services Sunday night at 6.15 and um, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. At, um, but then also don't forget that we have our virtual service. Our, our 11 o'clock service is not only physically here in our Family Life Center, but also we have it on Facebook. But if you live in the Ripley area, I pray that you consider to come and, 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 and join us physically here at the church. We've got a good group of people. Love them to death. I'm honored to be their pastor. And uh, as I pray, and I pray for you, and you pray for me, I pray that we all come back Sunday morning expecting God to change and touch lives beginning with me and beginning with you. Uh, love you all, and you have a good night.